Yeah, we're we're alive right now. Yeah, there's definitely people waiting to uh, to hear All from right. you. All right. Yeah, Great. I'll, I'll uh, instead of you know I'm, I'm you can never I, I never like really get like a good podcast introduction. I just like to, to go into it. But anyway, uh, we'll we'll do it for the people. I'm here with Peter Shanky. Here we go. Ready? I'll start the podcast now that we have some people dropping in live. Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Alan Soslowski, sitting in for Jeff Erickson while he lives the life of leisure. Here with very special guests, Rotowire co-founder, president, Peter Shanky. What's up, Peter? Hey, thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you uh, you get to cut the, the the red velvet rope if you ever want to come on the podcast. You know that. But there's um <laughs> the reason I wanted to have you on today. You know, first of all, you know we're at the point of the fantasy football season where you know takes are exhausted. So I'll ask you some of your football takes, which I always love having towards the end of the podcast. But um, Rotowire has been in the news recently with the sale of the of your company to and along with your partners to the gambling group, uh, gamblinggroup.com. Was it? It's gambling.com group, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of questions, especially from some of the Rotowire subscribers and longtime readers of the content. And we'll cover all of that, including what it means for them and, and everything, what your role is going to be. But first, I, I think there's a lot of people that want to know the history of Rotowire. Like, how did, when did the company start? How long has it been around? Just give us some of those details. Well, it's essentially been five years. So about 25 years ago uh, in December, uh, Jeff Erickson and Herb Ilk and I got together. We'd always, uh, Herb and I in particular, had thought about starting an internet business. And he wanted, you know, this is, uh, so this is 1996. And, you know, Yahoo just gone public. Uh, we're going way back here. This sounds like I'm talking about the Civil War or something. And uh, he had a bunch of ideas, wedding site, whatnot. And eventually I said, uh, why don't we do fancy sports? We spend so much time on it anyway. And uh, my day job at the time was I was a, reporter for, uh, for a newswire service called Dow Jones Capital Market Report. And I covered the uh, futures and options market in Chicago. And at the time, I thought my, my idea was, why don't we create for fantasy sports what the Bloomberg terminal was and similar services for I remember that. traders. The, it was called floor. the Bloomberg, right? That like little computer that it's sat still, on people's desk. Still does to this day. I mean, there's still, no, you still, can, around. You know, still, you know, in the Bloomberg, plenty of money. So, and that's the primary uh, you know, product, right? It's that same, same terminal. I'm sure it's changed a lot in the last 25 years, but, uh, that was kind of the concept. And, and uh, you know, so we came up with player news, uh, as, as kind of like the main idea, uh, which still, you know, to this day, everybody follows our standard of news and then analysis, you know, that's what we originated. And, you know, we built, you know, custom scoring so you could input your league based on project, get back, you know, uh, rankings based on, uh, we were one of the first, if not the only people to do that. Um, and so, you know, we had, we built a website right away and, and we've been doing it ever since. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of ups and downs. We, we sold the company in 1999 to a company called Broadband Sports uh, that quickly went bankrupt. Or, it was kind as, of as Chris, time, Liss, yeah. as Chris Liss always calls them the fraud band. Yes. Yes. <laughs> then we got, we took the company back after that out of bankruptcy and, um, and uh, they wouldn't, uh, as part of that process, they wouldn't give us our name back. Our what was URL. the original name of the company? Oh, Rota, Rota, the original name is Rotodews, Rotodews.com. If you go to Rotodews.com right now, it goes to Rotowire. We eventually did get the name back. But we had changed our name when we restarted the company. Same people. And we've been doing it under that name for the last 20 years. And uh, it's the same partners, same people. Um, you know, at, at, at one point uh, in that process, as we moved along, Chris Listen, another person who's, I don't know if he's been on your podcast, but Tim Schuler, our CFO, and, uh, you know, does lots of content stuff behind the scenes. Uh, you know, he, he joined as a partner as well. So it was the five of us as partners for like the last 20 years. And, um, you know, it's been, you know, and beyond that, the staff uh, has been very stable. You know, and people who are, are listening now probably, you know, have come, you know, are familiar with our writers and editors and podcast hosts. And it's been a very uh, stable group of people for the last uh, you know, 10 to 20 years. And we have people who are freelancers who write for us, who you, you may not see or know as, as a consumer of the product, who've been writing for us for over 20 years. So yeah, it's been a very stable group and it's been a fun ride. And, uh, you know, kind of the gist of the the, the acquisition of the, of the sale 
was there's just a whole opportunity coming in with with you know legalization of sports betting in, in America, and it's going to really change the industry, and uh, we need to you know figure out how to attack that market and um, provide a lot of value to our readers and for all the, you know not just not only sports betting which will probably become available to you know almost everybody out there in the audience that's listening. Uh, sports betting in a legal and regulated way. Um, but also there's going to be just a lot of innovation and new product ideas that are going to come along. And we want to be at the forefront of providing news and analysis for that. I mean, I think uh, uh, innovative companies like DraftKings and FanDuel and MGM and all the, all the other uh, sports betting entities that are getting into the game, uh, the U.S. media market are going to come up with a whole bunch of new products and ideas that we probably don't even know. Um, you know, 10 years ago or, or so, uh, you know, daily fantasy sports was not something that I'd contemplated being as big as it is now and, you know, that being a, a market that would require all kinds of news and analysis. And so, you know, stuff's coming. I don't know exactly what it is, but we want to be well positioned for it. And this, this really helps us do that. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you a ton of questions about that. We fast forward a little bit. I just want to rewind a second. Also, I'm fascinated uh, about the business of fantasy sports because just like every fantasy player, you know, I love fantasy sports and anyone who's usually in this industry is in it because they love it. It really wasn't their first choice. You know, I know a lot of people that said they were going to go to law school or they were going to, you know, be a school teacher or they were going to start some other business. Like go back to the beginning. Like uh, you said a little bit, you were doing financial stuff, but did anyone, when you said that you wanted to do fantasy sports analysis in the nineties, did they, uh, people must've told you it was a horrible idea. Yeah, it definitely was a little bit of a, you know, a odd thing for us to do. I remember I tried to hire an accountant the first year that I, we had the company. And, uh, you know, he took the business, he looked at it, and he said, you know, I can't actually take this 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 work. I can't be your your accountant because this this is this is gambling. This is like illegal gambling. Right. Oh, it's fantasy sports. I mean, like, most people only play for money, you know, and let alone that it's not gambling as later on uh, the industry, you know, kind of won that fight. But just people just didn't, you know, just didn't even understand it. And there are very few people that even knew anyone that played fantasy. Now, if I meet anyone in any walk of life about fantasy sports or fantasy football in particular, even if they don't play, they will say, oh, yeah, you know, my my nephew plays, my son plays, my brother plays, or, you know, something like that. Some some idea of what it is. But back then, yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, definitely a leap of faith to, to think that we could make money. But we could see it. I mean, you know... We could see the market growing, but we just love doing it. I mean, we, you know, at the end of the day, we had a bunch of other business ideas potentially do, but we knew we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't be successful because we just weren't that passionate about it. Whereas, you know, fantasy right. sports, we just figured we're already spending all this time anyway. So how much work is it going to be? You know, it ended up being a lot more work, but it never felt like work because, you know, it's, you know, uh, when you, when you love it, I right. still play. You yeah. I mean, for myself, I mean, I still play. I mean, I'm in, I'm in uh, 16 fans, season long fantasy football leagues this year, right? And, some of that is work and, you know, I get to, you know, obviously since that's my job, I get to, you know, have the time to do that, but it's also because I'm just super into it and I'm not giving up any leagues. It's, it's fun, you know? And so it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to say no. You know, so. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned something before. It's that back, like in the early days of fantasy sports, especially when it was, you know, starting to become a business or at least, you know, a full-time hobby you could do as a side hustle. Um, and everyone thought it was gambling. I, I, People that subscribe to RotoWire, they've been with the they they've been subscribers for a long time, and especially some. But for some of the newer subscribers over the last five or eight years, they forget that like even the NFL shunned fantasy as recently as like 10, 12 years ago. Yeah, there there were stories um, that you know I met some of these people who uh, it would be used as a pretext to fire them from their job. So they would be in a league, you know, in the office, and you know they have a twenty fifty dollar entry fee or something like that. And, uh, you know, their manager would find out about it and they, they get fired over it because they'd have a rule for, that you can't gamble, you know, mm -hmm. it at work. Um, now, maybe that's not the real reason they got fired. Maybe there's something else, the reason <laughs> they got fired. But they're high, kind of profit. But that's kind of like what it was seen as. And so there's like a risk to play fantasy sports. And um, like I said, a lot of people just didn't understand it. The leagues that definitely, um, they just thought it was like this geeky gambling Star Trek kind of thing that, you know, they didn't want to be associated with. I would say with. Dungeons and Dragons, you know, it's like that's yeah, the, the game we associated with geeks, you know, like, yeah, exactly. I played, so that, I um, yeah, so that, you know, that, that definitely, um, you know, that, that was, so that was, a, that was a problem. But what happened was in 2004 and we're kind of going on a side here. I can give you a lot of, I could give you a lot about fantasy sports, but in like, I think 2004, they did a survey of all their, of their, 
you know, of the people who like the NFL, their customers. And they found so out the, that- one second, I just want to just clarify. The NFL did a survey in 2004? Yeah, the NFL, right? They did a survey okay. of, you know, of the NFL fans and found out that um, the, uh, you know, fans- See, sports fans were their best fan, were their best customers. You know, they they attended more games, they they bought more jerseys, and most importantly, they watched way more hours of TV of of NFL football. And so, all right the away, stuff then that's they obvious can, now, right? All the stuff that seems yeah, so right. obvious right now and today, but yeah, right. But so back then, and then so finally, it was just like a light bulb went on. They finally got it, and they just completely so that they were you know promoting fantasy football and um, and fully behind it. And, and, and but you know, for six to ten years. Um, you know, we you know, at least the online version and farther before that, before I was in the industry, um, you know, it was like pulling teeth to try to get them to do anything, you know, for fantasy. They were just were very, you know, very against it. And the media companies were that way too. I remember in the early days of fantasy, we'd have fantasy conventions. So this is like 2000, 2001. Somebody from uh, ESPN would show up. I remember Eric Mo from ESPN is still there. He showed up on a panel one time and everyone just berated him. Like, why don't you talk about fantasy baseball on fantasy, on, fan- on baseball tonight? Like that's the only people that are watching that show. Like who else wants, you know, the highlights from every, you know, Marlins Reds game or, you know, when they're both in last place. And he was like, I, I get it. I, I can't convince the players that fantasy is something they should put on there. It's hard to, it's hard to even think that that was a possible, you know, that that was how it was back then, but it was. And, um, you know, it took a while for ESPN to finally turn the corner and realize it as well. And it kind of came in conjunction with the leagues, but, um, you know, eventually they hired Matthew Barry and, you know, beefed up their, staff and they just went all in on fantasy and uh you know that was great for the industry as well but you know not you know 2000 the nfl didn't like fantasy espn didn't like fantasy it was kind of amazing you know, so. yeah it's it reminds me a lot if you a more recent example is the ufc like you know the espn wanted or the major networks wanted nothing to do with fighting and now it's you know it's it's featured in prime time uh on saturday night sometimes so it just takes some time um and innovators like yourself and someone like dana white they see it coming and they're able to capitalize on that so you're the president of rotowire you've been for you know you're one of the co-founders what's the big people must say when you when they meet you and you say what do you do for a living oh i'm the president of a fantasy company it's been around for two decades what's the biggest myth about your job that people think is true, but you know, when, when we pull back the curtain, it may not be as glamorous. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think they realize like how big a car, how many people there are. They're always like, Oh, do you have an office? You know, do you just work from home, do this by yourself. <laughs> and it's like, no, there's actually, you know, we have 150 freelancers and 35 full timers and it's a 24 seven news operation. And, um, you know, it's big business, you know? So I mean, while our company is not like, you know, uh, a huge, you know, global, you know, thousands and people, you know, type company. It's still a kind of a, a small business. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a real, it's a real operation. I think a lot of people just think I just write a blog at home or something like that. When I tell them I have to explain it, be, but now, you know, that, that was a lot, uh, that was tougher to explain maybe 10, 15 years ago, like, you know, more recent times as fantasy just gotten bigger and bigger. I think people, people, a lot of people know us although, or a lot of people just get it. You know I mean? They just realize like, Oh yeah, you're, you're in that industry. And, um, you know, as opposed to a long time ago. Now, every business has its like near death moments, right? Where you're not sure if it's if you're going to be able to make payroll the next you know day or the next week or whatever. But when was that flip the switch moment where you just knew it was going to work? What happened? When was it uh, where you were like, "We got this. It's gonna, it's happening." Well, we're I think make- in the early days, you know, when we were Roto News and then we sold it, all kind of stuff. Uh, our business model is that we are free, and the idea is we just get a lot of traffic and then just figure it out. And so we'd have real big ups and downs based on the ability to sell advertising. So 20 years ago, we were actually one of the first websites, not just in fantasy, not sport, but really period, that offered a paid subscription. I mean, everything was free, free, free back then. Every newspaper was free. Um, nobody could figure out how to make money on the internet. And so we decided, at the, you know, you know we, we weren't making consistent money. And we were like, we just need to charge and, 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 and hope that works. And it did. And people paid for it. We got consistent cash flow. We were able to put that back in the business and budget. And you know, that, you know, right away, you know, the first year, the second year, it was like, wow, this is actually, you know, working out. This is going to be a really steady business. And it has been ever since. I mean, and, uh, you know, I think that's worked out really well. I think the customers have gotten, uh, it's been a great, good arrangement for them too. We've been able to, you know, build the business, build tools, hire people, um, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, they keep coming, you know, they keep luckily keep coming back and it's worked out. I think it's worked out pretty well. And I think people, they get back. Um, 
I'm hoping uh, we'll use a lot of free resources if you want. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you need to know something that's going on with the a player and you need, you know, that you're on the clock and you got to like type in their name and figure out, you know, what's the latest news on them and their stats and pull up the projection, you know, we're there for them, you know? So, um, so I think people have, you know, have consistently found that there's a value there. So, that, so that's really kind of what, you know, when it really became like, Oh, this is actually going to work out. Whereas the first four years, it was like, we're getting lots of traffic and lots of excitement, but it was like, are we really making money? <laughs> so. Yeah. And uh, th- just let everybody know, we're going to take a quick break here from a word from our sponsors. Okay, we're back. I'm sure you enjoyed that, right? That's uh, for the for the audio version, for the YouTube version, for the live version. You don't have to uh, sit through the the paid spots right now. We'll uh, we'll talk about some of our sponsors at the end. Hey, Peter, I was always wondering, you know, uh, who, did you have a professional mentor in the fantasy business, or I guess at all in any business? Did, was there someone that mentored you that, you know, if it wasn't an official relationship, maybe really just gave you good advice along the way and and really mentored you a little bit? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say there's any person, but you know, the community of the fantasy sports industry um, has been pretty tight and really helped each other out. Uh, when when we first met each other at the first ever industry conference in like 1999, it was great because we met all these people. Many of them still today, like Rick Wolf and Greg Ambrosius. Um, and it was it was like, wow, you're into fantasy, you know? I am too, you know, because it was so hard to find people. And you run a business, you know. And so then it was just a lot of good information, you know, sharing as far as you know, how to, how to run this as a business. You know, we all faced a lot of the same uh, issues, especially on the legal front. Like, you know, uh, you know, like I said, you know, the legality of, of fantasy sports in the early days was very much in question. And then collectively, you know, we worked together to, to solve a lot of those things. And so Fantasy Sports Trade Association, it was known then, and now as the Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association, um, has been, you know, fairly inst- instrumental in, you know, the growth of Rotowire and the growth of the entire business. And I think you would, if you talk to anyone um, at, at, at similar companies, they would say the same thing. And, you know, we won a lot of battles, you know, uh, Major League Baseball tried to basically put a monopoly on on fantasy baseball uh, by, um, you know, acquiring all the rights to the player names. We won a, a case that all went, went all the Supreme Court on that. Um, that made it so that anybody could offer a fantasy baseball game without having to go through me. Let me, so let like, me ask oh. you about that though. So yeah. when that, how, how long ago was that case and was it Rotowire versus major league baseball or was it the collective fantasy community versus fantasy uh, versus uh, major league baseball? Sorry. Uh, I mean, that was, you know, really until uh, the case was all 2006 I have in front of me. Um, yeah. But you know, before then it was always a big gray area as far as, uh, you know, who who owned the play? If you had to pay the leagues for the use of the player names in conjunction with the fantasy game or commissioner service, um, and there was kind of a tension of, you know, whether it was you know you pay the you you would pay the 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 players unions and the players for that, um, and then eventually what happened is Major League Baseball acquired the rights from the baseball players union, and they went to all the games and basically said, you know, we're only going to have like one you know one or two people that do the game, or you know we're going to put really tight restrictions on it. And there was one company, uh, CDM Sports, and his owner, Charlie Wigger, or one of the owners, was the kind of lead guy that challenged it in court. And then the whole industry supported him, and we eventually won. And so that made it where, um, you know, all the, all, you know, all the, there's a lot of operators that could do it. There were, you know, there were really um, three big, three big things. And uh, let me just pause it for one second because I got to put in my power cord or my computer's going to run out. Yeah, live, that's fine. Live, I'm here. It, it's, radio. it's, Perfect time to do an ad. I'm going to do a perfect time for an ad read. This is a, the the NFL season is heating up, and Yahoo is going big on daily fantasy football this season. There is a ton of big prize contests throughout the year on Yahoo, including the multi-entry contest now shark free to celebrate. Yahoo is going big on DFS as well, and uh, daily fantasy becoming shark free. Yahoo is giving users an opportunity to claim ten dollars free site credit users could take advantage of this free ten dollar site credit uh, for just by going into any paid contests including yahoo's biggest contest the weekly one million dollar dfs baller contest the weekly one million dollar contest features a million bucks in total prizes including first prize of a hundred thousand dollars uh play daily fantasy on yahoo visit sports.yahoo.com slash daily fantasy slash welcome to claim your free ten dollar offer to get started I'm Alan Soslowski sitting in for Jeff Erickson. I'm here with Peter Shanky, the 
co-founder and president of Rotowire. You've uh, many of you know him and have uh, read his his content and and heard Peter talk on on different podcasts and things like that. We're talking today about the business of fantasy sports and the recent sale of Rotowire to the Gambling.com Group. All right, Peter, I was just curious, by the way. So what I always like talking to people that run businesses and what time of the day is do you get your best work done? What, what are you, you know, are you are super early in the morning. Are you a night owl? When do you get your most of your work done? Oh, well, I'm a night owl. And uh, and and uh, if everybody's listening, that was great live uh, radio and shows how how big an outfit we are that we have all these producers and set up that I have to uh, pause to go uh, plug in my computer. It was, it was a perfect time for a live reeve. It, it, we, I, yes, you know, I didn't want that, to interrupt your flow before. So we, if we, I could we have put a sponsor. You somehow with our advanced technology behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> Content is good. In 2021. No, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a late night guy. So I get my stuff done late at night, you know, um, from night owl. So, and then, you know, it works out pretty well with, with working at a sports company where there is so much, uh, you know, activity at night, especially baseball season, you know, baseball games. And so, you know, there's a lot of activity at Roadwire at, you know, 1 a.m. Central time. So, uh, so, so doing work, but yeah, that's what the, generally speaking, I'm, I'm a night owl. I'm the kind of guy that just stays up until I get everything done um, and then go to bed. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's funny because I, I have the opposite. Again, I, I do some of my best work in the morning and as the day goes on is where I start to see the decline, but I get up nice and early and I, and I start just knocking stuff out. So it's interesting to hear different people has their, their different times of the day. Uh, one of the most common questions I've been getting is what happens for the consumer now that the company has been sold to a publicly traded company, is anything going to change in the short term in the next three months, six months, one year? Uh, I know it's impossible to predict things, you know, a year out, but just, Talk to, for a minute to the consumer of Rotowire content and the website. What's going to be different, if anything? Well, in the very short term, you know, in the foreseeable near term, nothing, right? I mean, it's the same people. We're all here. You know, um, we're all staying on. It's the same writers, editors, people behind the scenes. So nothing's going to change. Um, you know, we're still fantasy sports guys, even though this is a big opportunity with um, sports betting. Um, you know, we all are just diehard fantasy sports guys, and we're not giving that up. Um so, nothing, so really, I mean, I think if, you know, if you're using this for fantasy baseball, fantasy football, you know, you love the projections, you love the magazine, you love the dirt, you know, the, the, uh, the app, that's not going to change. Um, and I think we're just going to layer more stuff on top of it to help you when sports betting becomes legal in your state, because that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, many states are alive already. I mean, there's 30, 32 states that actually have, you know, that have passed sports betting or, um, or in some form, or it's, or it's going, they passed a law and it has, you know, a year or two to sort of get everything rolled out. Um, that's not all online. Some is, like here in Wisconsin is just retail. Um, but, you know, it's coming to you pretty soon, right? So you're going to have more opportunities. And so we're going to layer that on top on Rotowire. And so what I'd say to the customers is this kind of happened with, with daily fantasy sports. So 2010, 11, 12, you know, daily fantasy sports exploded. And we added a lot of tools and content to Rotowire. And I think there was a big fear from the season long fans who used us that, uh, you know, they're going to ruin, ruin the site. You know, I'm all into my season long fantasy baseball league. I don't care about daily fantasy sports. You know, what's all this daily fantasy sports stuff on the website, but that didn't happen. You know, the first thing was, you know, the way we did the layout and the content. And even today, if you don't really fantasy sports and you just want to focus on season long football, no problem. I mean, you can, you know, you're, you, you don't have, it doesn't have to be in your world. You know, all the other features that you need are there. Um, so the tabs are on there. And I think 10 years later, if you looked at it, I think that the website's better than ever, right? We have the daily fantasy stuff and the season long stuff. And we were able to make enough money and add more talent and resources, such as this video that we're doing right now in the podcast, um, that it lifted the boat for the season long guys, right? They, you know, they got more tools and more people and, and all kinds of stuff. You know, we had to up our game on daily projections and lineups, for example, from, you know, from before DFS. And that's really helped season long, right? Because you have to make, you know, decisions based on that stuff as well. We didn't have that in 2006, seven, and eight, because there just wasn't as much a need for it for season long. But even if you had the exact same season long league with the same rules in 2015 or 2020, that stuff benefits you, right? I mean, you know, it's a Monday and you got to figure out how to start we didn't have daily lineups to the same degree that we, you know, 2006 that we do now that helps you. So I think the same thing's going to happen with sports betting. We're going to overlay a lot more sports betting information 
and tools that we're going to build. And this deal is going to help us do that. But we're going to be able to do it in a way that if you're not into sports betting and you don't want anything to do with it, it's not going to it's not going to impact you, you know. And but some of that money and talent that we get in in, in the door as part of this is going to ha- is going to lift the boat for everyone, and we'll figure out how to make the season long tools uh, better. And you know, I think I've seen a couple of comments from people like, "Ah, oh, season long's the best, man! Don't give up on it," you know, like. No, we're not doing that. And that's that's still the, the bread and butter of, uh, of us who, you know, who, are, who are at the company. Regular consumers of fantasy products are becoming smarter and smarter. I mean, the, obviously, the internet makes everything small. People are interested in it. So, yeah, there are going to be some subscribers that are just like, hey, they're, they're not even aware of the sale of the company. It doesn't affect them. They're just going to keep using the site that they've always had. But what a, what a lot of people, uh, you know, again, just regular consumers have asked questions. I've gotten them on Twitter. I've gotten them in DMs is – how did this whole thing come about? How did you connect with the gambling group? Who are they? And how did you guys connect and come to this realization that this was good, best for both parties moving forward? Uh, I mean, I've, I, you know, I've known them, you know, at conferences and I've seen, I've seen them, uh, their products, just kind of know of them. I mean, they're, they're a European based company that started by Americans. So they, they, they kind of know the both worlds really well, which is why it's a, a good fit. Um, they've had a successful business for over a decade in Europe. It's a profitable company. They know the gambling world and the sports betting world very well, but they're also American founders. So they, you know, they're knowledgeable and sort of steeped in U.S. culture of sports and sports betting and fantasy sports. So that's kind of a rare combo. I mean, most of the companies that are coming in the market uh, for sports betting in particular, especially the operators, um, they're very European and they don't really know the, the, the U.S. market. I think they've had some trouble adjusting. They especially don't know fantasy. They don't, they don't get it. I mean, fantasy in Europe is not really at all what it is here. Um, and so I think that's been a little bit of an impediment for them as they've sort of moved into the U S um, and these guys, they got it right. So they, that, that, from that aspect, it seemed like a pretty good fit, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, we've, we've, you know, throughout the whole history, I've always, my, myself as, as the president, I've always had a, you know, uh, an approach to say, you know, Hey, you know, if you, if you want to figure out a, a paper, for sale or for a dope and let's talk but you know we we you know we had a good viable you know strong company and we weren't going to do something like this unless we thought it was a really good fit and you know to be honest we got a good return for the work we've done and this one just you know it worked out really well and so once once we started once they're in once they're interested you know we talked to them and uh, i think we got a, a combination that's going to be a, a, a real winner going forward what's something um maybe a point of view or a expertise uh, opinion that you have on the industry that almost nobody agrees with you on? <laughs> I don't know about that, really. I mean, the, the nobody that I'm really like different anyone else on. Um, Is there something about the really business of fantasy I'm, or the fantasy? Leader, you know, so I, you Say know, that. I'm I, t- I, I, guess- I talked over you. That's fine. I think probably the biggest thing is just that fantasy is still going to be viable. And, you know, I think that's not like, um, that's not necessarily an opinion, um, a minority opinion, right? Where I'm an outlier. But I think as sports betting moves into the U.S., I think there's a lot of people in the business, especially those that come from Europe and places where there's been established sports betting the whole time that are like, well, fantasy is just kind of insignificant. It'll just go away. You know, it'll just be, you know, that was just because Americans couldn't bet. And they don't really get the essence of fantasy, which is, no, that's not, you know, I, you know, most of the leagues I play fantasy on, I don't even care about the money. I don't even know what the money is. You know I mean? Some of the best leagues I'm in are for $0 or $10 entry fee, right? Where it's just, you know, it's just not even a big deal, but the competition, you know, I want to win that league. That, that's the most fun, you know? And then, you know, sure, there are league you can win a lot of money on and sure. Who would want to win the, you know, the DraftKings Millie Maker or the $500,000 contest on FanDuel or whatever. I mean, that, that's too. And if that's, if that's where you're, um, that's what gets you excited and that's what you want. Awesome. You know, but that's not really the core of fantasy core of fantasy is just competing with each other, players and that analysis, you know, winning the game within the game um, and not really about the money. And I think that a lot of people in the sports betting world um, who come from, like I said, from established you know, countries where they don't, where there's sports, sports betting countries where there's established sports betting and there's not fantasy don't really get that. And that's one of the things about the, that was great about the gambling.com group you know, they got that, you know, that was like right away that, you you know, you could tell, you know, given their backgrounds and everything like that and their approach to the company was, you know, they, they understood that. Right. So, they, you know, they think, you know, they're, they're super excited about fantasy. They want to figure out how we can, you know, take the existing company and make it better, but then add in, you know, the sports spending on top of it and try to figure out how to make more tools and, um, 
you know, and, and, and economic activity around that in a way that uh, our, our, our users and the relationships we've had with all our customers over these years, uh, you know, enhances that, doesn't ruin it or destroy it. So, you know, that, that thing, I think that's, you know, that's, that's going to be good, but yeah, that's the main thing. I was waving the flag. And, uh, you know, I think Rotowire and the industry in general, we have the best, you know, the best customers of anybody in the sports business. And uh, I think everyone, the, the, the sports betting world is going to realize that pretty soon. What I, what I always liked about Rotowire as a consumer first before I was working for the company is that Rotowire always assumed that the subscribers uh, were smart rather than talking to them like they were just idiots and didn't know. They, had, they, they assumed a certain baseline of, uh, of sharpness, not necessarily about like, it just, they, they've always taught people, Rotowire, we always taught people how to think about the game rather than just like, Hey, y- yes, we do say pick the player, pick that player. If you want those ad- pieces of advice, but teaching people how to play the game. And, and you kind of answered my question, my next question, which is what do you think Rotowire, uh, has a premium on like, what do you think that we do better than anyone else in the industry? And there's a lot of great sites out there that you know that either come and go or that you know we've been around a long time rotowire has been around for over two decades so what do you think it is what do we do that better than anybody else well i you know i think your first part of the thing is that yeah that definitely has been our attitude the whole time is that we don't you know don't use our rankings blindly right i mean that's just that's dumb it's like you know we're not soothsayers you know I, i mean so we just try to teach you how to be a better fantasy player and I think that's going to be the same approach for sports betting. It has been, you know, from the sports betting section is like, you know, we're not going to, we're not promising you winners, right? I mean, you know, any, you know, if you're buying picks from someone, you know, you're making a huge mistake, you know, and I know Chris Liss always beats that drum. Um, we just want to, you know, but we want to give you tools and resources to give you the best chance that you, you know, that you're going to, you know, win your sports bet or win your fantasy league. So that's, that's kind of the idea I've always had to, to really just be honest and say, we're not smarter than that. You know, we're not, we're not so smart that you should just take our advice blindly because no one is, you know, no one is, you got to do your own work. And when it comes to fantasy and sports betting, you really, you really have to make an independent decision because everything's a little bit different. You know, fantasy, you got to know your rules, you know, what league, you know, what are your league mates like? What is this a competitive league? What are your goals? Is your goal to win the league or is your goal to just make the playoffs? You know, because that's a different approach, right? Same thing for sports betting. You know, what is your, what are your goals? You know, are you, are you trying to, you know, are you trying to take a bankroll and make it a little bit bigger? Are you, or are you trying to like, you know, have fun and, you know, take a shot at, at winning a huge jackpot? You know, what's your risk tolerance and, you know, what, what are the specifics? What, what platform are you betting on? You know, what are the, you know, what, are the, what is the juice that you're paying? All that kind of stuff. It's, you know, you really got to think for yourself in order to be successful in either endeavor. And so that's what we've really tried to do for Rotowire. But as far as us from the competition, I think we've always been really innovative. I mean, we've always been the, the people that are doing doing things first. And I think this deal in particular goes along those lines where, you know, we're trying to be a first mover and come up. We came up with the, you know, the daily, the optimizer for, for daily fantasy sports. That was something that we really, uh, there were some other ones out there, but we're the ones that really put it together and made it the product that it is for the industry today. You know, we came up with player news. We came up with text alerts, you know, and, and sometimes we came up with, with uh, ideas and somebody else, and took it and did it better. But, you know, we've always been trying to push the envelope. And then we've all, our core competency really is, you know, real-time news and information. You know, for over 20 years, we're still the place to go when, some, when news breaks and you want to get it quick and figure out what it means in terms of starting lineups and depth charts and, you know, projection changes. Uh, you know, all of that tied into it together, um, you know, and having a, a, a robust workforce that can, you know, just take all that stuff and, you know, um, update everything really fast. That that is really you know, the, the thing we've been able to do. And that just comes from, you know, just being super into it ourselves and, you know, having a really good workforce that's communes- you know, communicates with each other and knows what to do and tech guys that know how to build tools to make it all happen. So, um, and I think, like I said, for sports betting, we're going to do the same thing. What was the first real job you ever had going back before, you know, before this? I know you said that you were first doing this, but yeah, first real job you ever had going back. Uh, that was a caddy. So a golf course, you know, like a, we do that before you're 18. So, yeah, I was a caddy. So I learned a lot about golf, uh, which was great. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that part was fun. Got to play for free on Mondays at, at the golf course when I caddied. But, uh, yeah, it's that, amazing that, was, that, that's, that was the huge benefit. You got to play for free, right? I mean, of course, you made a few well, bucks. I mean, you know, yeah. It was a fancy, fancy uh, golf course that when you're you know, 16, you can't really otherwise afford to get into. But I did make me a good golfer. I'm, I'm still a terrible golfer, so it didn't. 
I know a lot about golf as a result, but uh, my game never improved really. So, what what was your first car that you ever had? And, and again, just to give you you know some context here, I mean, you know, everyone either had a clunker first or this or that, or what was what was the first time that they handed you the keys and it was yours? No, the first car I ever bought was a Saturn. So you know, it shows how old I am. But I remember those, the Saturn. They were they were like all plastic, right? Yeah, it, it was a quality car. I mean, it certainly was nothing sexy, but got the job done and low maintenance. So. Um, it's not, not, it's not the kind of thing you look back at and say, well, wow, it was like a, you know, car that, you know, I wish we could buy again. And it was, you know, so it was, it was, you know, it was great, but, but, uh, you know, it got the job done. So I can't complain. I, I had a, uh, a two tone Brown 1979 Ford Fairmount. And the key was that, cause you know, I got it for free, you know, my grandfather gave it to me for free and he had to stick a pencil in the carburetor for it to start. So it wasn't exactly, uh, you know, great on dates. You know what I'm saying? You had to uh, <laughs> build character. You had to go out into the front in the freezing cold, lift the hood, stick the pencil in the carburetor. So I, that, you know, it always, uh, a couple, a couple more like just like fun questions before I get back into the uh, the, the business side. What was your favorite childhood sandwich? Sandwich. Uh, childhood I I, sandwich. I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a. Uh, I'm not. You know. I'm not, I don't know if I'm that much of a foodie. You guys are going to remember it. You know. So not in the food. What was it like? What was your favorite brown bag? Was it? A, were you a peanut butter and jelly kind of person? A bologna Probably and cheese. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, for yeah. some reason, I, I used to like bologna and American cheese. I don't know. Like, I would never even think to eat that now, but that was like a thing when, you know, when we were kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, both, Next, both food and cars from here are just means to an end. It, you know, I don't really have a, a whole lot of, uh, you know, neither yeah, one just, of them do I spend a lot of time. Uh, another one here. What was your first nostalgic memory of football? When did you fall in love with football? Was it a game that you saw? Was it a video game that you played? What's that when you think about like football when you were a kid? What's that first thing that pops into your mind? I mean, I've been a fan of sports for so long that I just don't I don't remember like the first of anything. It's just always been part of what I what I am, right? So I mean, I can kind of remember like, the Cowboys Broncos Super Bowl with Craig was it Craig Morton is the you know the Orange Crush? You know that's probably the first Super Bowl. So that shows you how old I am, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I can remember the. Uh, Yankees Dodgers, the two series in the 70s. So, you know, I'm, you know, I was what, seven, eight years old or something like that. So I can remember those, Reggie Jackson's three home runs. So, yeah, those are like my first memories, but I can never remember a time in my life when I was not a sports fan. So there's really no first. You know, I can't, I can't remember anything. I always collected baseball cards from the, you know, the day I probably remember. So yeah, I just, uh, it's baseball always cards. Been I remember I collected hockey cards, hockey cards and sticker books, things like that. That was, that was fun. And when I'm going to, we're going to take a short break here. I'm just going to do a quick read for our, uh, our partners at thrive, but it's a perfect leading because I do want to ask you about future of, of sports betting as, as it relates to prop betting, but uh, thrive is back for another season of fantasy football. And they're running a huge guaranteed contest each week in the NFL with thrive fantasy. You can eliminate countless hours of research, Focus on only the top tier athletes and the biggest names and who have impact on the game. Sign up today, get a free six month RotoWire subscription. The most important part about this read. Uh, here's how you claim your free RotoWire subscription visit rotowire.com slash thrive, deposit 10 bucks, and receive a hundred percent deposit match up to a hundred dollars. So if you put in a hundred dollars, they'll give you a hundred dollars of free money to play with. Play your uh, play in your first paid contest and receive six free months of RotoWire subscription. And I've played over at Thrive. They've been great partners of, of this podcast all season long. And uh, they are basically a prop betting. You know, you you pick which athlete will have um, a better score, or if they'll go over or under. Talk to me a little bit about, like, you know, when you when you talk about sports gambling, everyone always thinks of like, okay, I'm going to bet this team against the spread or against the goal line or the the you know the, the pitcher, you know, which you know, run line. How big of a, do you think prop betting is really where the future of sports betting is at? Well, it's definitely going to be, um, you know, pure prop betting um, where you're just doing one player um, is it definitely. Uh, something that's going to be bigger in the U.S. than it is uh, elsewhere in the world, and that's because of fantasy sports, right? I mean, it's to know what a you know what a three hundred yard passing game is, or um, similar type of benchmarks. Whereas in Europe, if you look, there's just no player stats. So they, they, that's one of the things about soccer. Um, people, but you know, they don't really talk. If you if yeah if you if you go to Europe and you talk to somebody about soccer or their football team and you ask them about the players and they start talking about the players, almost no stats are ever mentioned. You know, they're great on the pitch. They led us to our championship. They're really graceful. They you know they represent our country. The only stat that ever comes up is caps, like how many times they played for their international team. You know that that's it. Like that, it's just not part of the lexicon 
of of their sports uh, fandom. Here, it's totally if you if you walk down the street and you said, "Who's your favorite football player?" You know, and, you, and they started talking about him, they're going to talk about their career passing yards and that one year they threw thirty five touchdowns. And it just it's very much part of of the American sports culture, and that's kind of why fantasy sports grew up. Uh, and, and it was created not because it, it was an alternative to gambling, but just because of the statistics culture that there is in the U.S. around sports. And so I think you're going to see that happen a lot with sports betting. And we're seeing that as you know, FanDuel and DraftKings and other companies have you know pretty robust prop markets. And you can get you know prop bets down on all kinds of stuff. You know, the you want to take the under on the, on a defenseman for their uh, you know for their um, their, you know, points in, in, a, in an NHL contest, you know, or their power play points in a contest. I mean, you know, it's almost, it's almost the market just are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that U.S. consumers, especially the ones who played fantasy, are going to be, you know, really into it. And we've been trying to do that at RotoWire. If you go to the sports betting area for each of the sports, we have, uh, we have our projections and we compare them to the prominent sports books line. And go and there's a, a, a conspiracy comparison in there that shows you which ones we think are the best values each day compared to our projections and we plan to build out those tools uh, you know take them to the next level um, to you know give you alerts and all kinds of stuff because it's fun i mean you know you you know you've if you play in fantasy you get a real feel for what you think a player is going to do uh, in a game uh, and especially in some of these, you know, cat, you know, the categories. I mean, is a running back really going to get five receptions in a game? I mean, that, you know, unless they're a real pass catching back, sometimes that's pretty tough. You know, you know, is is this scrub player really going to get two blocks in you know, this guard that plays ten minutes? So, you know, I think that's going to be a lot of fun, and that part's going to grow a lot in the industry. And, um, you know, we're we're with with the steel, we're going to be able to, you know, really blow out all those tools to really help everyone. Anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot of uh, a, a raise in interest in live betting where you know for those of for those of you who are just watching the podcast for the first time or may not be as familiar with sports betting live betting is the odds change as the game goes on so you don't necessarily need to lay in your bet right when the game starts uh when tennessee is leading san francisco 10 nothing the odds could change and you could place a bet then uh people have been talking about making micro bets during live betting for a while. I'm curious of your thoughts. Like literally you could say, Hey, is the, they'll give you odds on is the next play going to be a pass or a run. And then there's live odds and you can voice text it in. So you would have like an, uh, a lightning wallet that has money in it. And then you could say, you know, Hey Alexa, or, Hey Amazon or Hey Siri. Um, what give me, you know, the odds on the next play. Do you see something like that uh, as part of the future? And if not, what do you think is the future of sports betting? That's definitely it there. There's definitely a whole technological component behind that that needs to improve. Um, you know, there's a lot of latency between like TV broadcasts when you see it and when you put in the bet and that, that needs to really get shortened to make a, just a true real time experience work where you're betting on every pitch or every play. Um, and I think that, you know, the industry from the analysis side also needs to catch up. I mean, there's not a lot of real-time tools right now for projections and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we hope to build in the, in the future um, because I think there will be a pretty robust market for that, you know, in game. You know, how much it's going to take off, I'm not sure. I know a lot of people like doing the betting in game, um, but how much of that is just like, you know, at the quarter you know, of a football game or at halftime or, you know, that kind of thing. Are people going to, you know, want to want to bet that micro? Maybe, you know, I'm not sure. I know that I probably wouldn't be as into it but there's been things over the last 20 years where I've been like, I'm not sure if that's going to be really that big. And then next thing you know, it's daily fantasy sports, right? So, you know, so you know, we want to be prepared here and have tools so that it becomes more and more popular. There's more and more product out there. We're going to have the tools that, that, that you need to help you win so that we'll have all that kind of real time stuff. I'm Alan Soslowski sitting in for Jeff Erickson on the Wednesday podcast, Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast, here with Peter Shanky, co founder and president of Rotowire. All right, Peter, people people stuck with us this long, so I'm curious about some of your fantasy football <laughs> takes. Uh, is there anything else you want to add about uh, the business of sports, or can we move on to some of your takes? Well, let's talk some bread and butter football here. So, Okay. All right. The, the, one, the most interesting thing I think going right now is the MVP race. With no quarterback standing out other than Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron Rodgers has uh, the – the you know the COVID narrative working against him is he just too good? Like who's your MVP right now? Uh, or are we going to finally see a position player, non quarterback, possibly take the MVP this year? I mean, if I was voting and I'd vote, I'd vote for Cooper Cup because he's just so 
group. And if you look at him historically, what, what he's done, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, and that's how I'd do it, especially with a year where there's quarterbacks that are just – there's no one that stands out ahead of, ahead of the field. Now, whether the voters themselves would actually do that, I mean, do they, you know, because the quarterback plays such a high percentage of the plays, is it really – is anyone besides the quarterback most valuable? I don't know. I'm not sure. And then really, you know, as far as the media narrative, is there going to be a media narrative built around uh, Jonathan Taylor or our cup to say that they should win it? You know, because sometimes that happens, right? I mean, regardless of, of the facts, it just becomes kind of like a, hey, we should give it give it to a non-quarterback this year. It's kind of a cool trend. Maybe that'll emerge. But um, for me, that's how I would, I would I would vote. I would look at the, you know, the, the player who's sort of uh, – plays enough i mean you're playing to a long snapper even if it's the greatest long snapper of all time right because how much impact do they have on the field but somebody at a position group who's very important you know plays a big percentage of the plays and it's just leaps and bounds of, above anybody else and to me cups this year is that for sure i mean his his numbers this year are you know going to break every record in a 17 game season and it could break every record in a 16 game season so it's, it's a very mvp worthy year yeah, heading into uh, last night's game, he was about hundred, just under 120 yards per game. Uh, he would need that in order to break Megatron's seasonal average or his total yardage total. Uh, and, and I agree with you. Cooper Cup is a great long shot bet. I think on some of the main sports book, he was still about ten thousand to one. Or, you know, it was like plus ten thousand. It was something really. It was great value. So maybe if you're out yeah, there, yeah. I mean, I, 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 from a betting perspective, I I think that's a good bet just because I think that like. Um, it's no, if there's no one quarterback that really stands out, then the people might go another direction. You kind of see that, you know, sometimes with the Heisman voting, right? Where it's just like, there's no one player that really stands out. So it just sort of gravitates to the top quarterback. That's kind of what happened this year. Although Young was pretty good, um, his numbers at the end. But, you know, it's sort of like whatever number one team, their quarterback. And I could see kind of working the other way in the NFL where there's, well, there's no one quarterback that really stands out. So let's go with this. You know, player who's got a really good narrative and really has a, a year that just you know jumps off the charts. So I think that could happen. Um, and so at the odds, you know, you're getting at least the way it's been trending the last couple of weeks, it seems like a pretty good value. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. I, I have a, I'm, I got to get my ticket in. I've been saying this for a couple of weeks on Cooper Cup, so I, that just uh, prompted me. All right, so their dynasty fantasy football is one of the oldest forms of, of fantasy football, but it is now seeing an emergence. I mean, they're the most hardcore players. They pay attention all year round. We're going to be starting a, dy a a second dynasty podcast. You know, Mario and John have their Thursday podcast. We're going to be uh, doing another one on Mondays, I believe, uh, and we're already starting to get questions about 2022 rankings. But I think before that, you have to determine where you project the free agents to go. Recently, Chris Godwin towards ACL is out for the season. He is set to be a free agent. Where do you think is going to happen to him? Is he a franchise tag? If you're a team, would you just pay full market price for an elite player in his prime like Chris Godwin, knowing that you probably won't get him until at least week seven or eight next year? It probably, I mean, like, could be like in baseball lots of times we sign a pitcher that's going to be out for the year you know, with Tommy John, and they sort of like just calculate on the equation and they make sure to lock him in for year two and year three when they know they're going to get the reward after he's back. So maybe he gets a contract like that where they lock him in for two or three years and, they, and the team knows year one they may not get much of anything. Um, and he might, he'll might he probably take a hit in the open market versus what he's going to get. But certainly someone's going to, some, someone's going to sign him given everything he's done so far. Um, just It's a really wild card as far as like when – back from an ACL tear. I mean, it used to be, you know, at least a year, you know, at least a year and a half until you're back to, to full form, you know, less than, less than, you know, 10, 10 months. So who's to say Godwin couldn't be, you know, really good for half a year like next year. It's just, it, you know, the, the ACL, it, uh, you know, the, 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 the procedure and the comeback and the training they get just keeps to improving all the time. So, you know, that's a real wild card. How, how long would he really be out? You, uh, in the preseason, I have some good video capture for, uh, of you, and I'll do a little victory lap for you. Even before Aaron Rodgers was certain to sign at, with Green Bay, you were on board as saying that you would like Devontae Adams as high as you wouldn't blink an eye if somebody took him at the first overall pick uh, in this year's redraft. If Aaron Rodgers does not return to the Packers, and I don't see the Packers letting Devontae Adams walk out the door, with, even if they have to franchise tag him, What's going to be your outlook on Devontae Adams from a redraft perspective, 2022, if Jordan Love or, you know, say they just get some veteran to hold the line if they're not confident in Love? Uh, I mean, he would definitely take a hit. Like, let's just say Love's the quarterback next year. Just because with Rodgers, you just know he's going to get all that, all those targets, right? You know he's going to get a line. You can just put it, you know, as long as he stays healthy, you can just put it in the bank. 
and that'll be really up in the air next year. So, you know, you know, he's, he's a great player. He'll continue to be a great player with anyone, but uh, I just don't know if that chemistry will be there. So, you, you know, you'd probably second or third round, depending on what you think of love and love has looked pretty terrible. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you take a huge hit for sure. Um, but yeah, this year, I mean, it was really, I mean, this year has been a good year for me fantasy wise because I'm always a wide receiver first guy. And I took, I took Hill and Adams and like, I've, I have that combo in a bunch of leagues and took a lot of right wide receivers early. And, you know, Calvin Ridley's definitely been a bust this year. Um, but you know, that's a, you know, he hurt really. I mean, it's kind of a different case than, you know, you kind of set that one aside. Um, and obviously Hopkins, you know, got hurt, but generally speaking, I think the receivers have, it's been a good year to go all in on and wide receivers early where running backs was just a total minefield and more typical of what a fancy football season is like. I mean, usually there's a bust rate of about 50 on the ground. This year it's even higher. I mean, obviously if you have Taylor, you're loving life, but you know, boy, anywhere else, and, and it's been a tough year. I made the, uh, you know, I'd heard this online, but I just, I echoed it to a bunch of people and I'm, I apologize. I, I'm not, I don't know who to credit, but someone said that people, even if you went running back early this year, you were going zero running back, whether you knew it or not, because of all the injuries that, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, now if you, took, uh, now if you got, now if you got cuff later on, then it does, you know, usually you could, you could avoid that. So, you know, at the end of the year, I think there's going to be fantasy football this year is probably going to come down to a very simple equation. Did you draft Jonathan Taylor? Did you draft Cooper cup? If not, you lost. You got them. You won. I mean, that's that's you know, it's probably going to be that that simple in, in many and most leagues. There, there was a window of time where you could have gotten where Jonathan Taylor was, uh, you know, ex- unexplainably falling to like the one-two turn. Where there's are some teams out there that drafted in that window that got Austin Eckler and uh, and Jonathan Taylor, and then landed on Cup as well. And those are the teams that undoubtedly will will be winning the big money in contests like oh, NFC if so they drafted me, during those times. So I mean, I'm in a league that's going the Mike Clay runs. It's got Matthew Barry, uh, Scott Pianowski, a bunch of other notable experts, Bob Harris. I'm forgetting. And uh, in that league, you know, it's a little bit of a crazy league. It's two, you start two quarterbacks, you start six wide receivers. So thus the name of the, of the league is going deep. Um, but it, we, I finished the year with, with, with the guy, I want somebody else from Roadwire who I run it with. And uh, we we finished in in, in in first place going in the playoffs we had last week, and in that league we actually got Jonathan Taylor in the third round. And that was that was you know so it's a little bit crazy because I mean obviously people think a lot of backs early and wide receivers nuts. And that was right about the time when they had the injuries in Indianapolis, but um, but that that looks like the greatest value ever. And we had you know we had Cook and uh, Tyreek Hill as our first two picks, and then Jonathan Taylor. So that's about as good as a one, two, three, one, two, three combo you're ever going to get. And we had Madison, we had Alexander Madison as a, on the roster as well. So you got the full value of all the all the Vikings running backs. So we finished the year first in total points, and hopefully we'll pull out the win here. Yeah, fantasy running backs are all about finding those windows. And you're being generous with your time. I just have a couple more quick questions for you. Uh, the um, uh, For... What, what, what was the player at Lucy? I had one here I wanted to ask you about for next year. Um, no, I asked you about Godwin already and all of that. Yeah, no, that that was it then. I had everything else. Um, fan, for the right, real so NFL player. One, one shout out, so one shout out to Henry Weinberg, who's who's the yeah, I run the league with. So I, I, I admitted his name there, but uh, so he's he he's my co-manager. I got you know he's 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 done some work here for he, he's a writer here at Rotowire, and uh, I give him a lot. He's of the real reason. So just the me. real. He's the real reason yes. that you guys are winning that league. Okay, I got it. Yes, You're, exactly. I got it. Although, I, although I did pull for Taylor in the third round, I was like, "Come on, we got to take him here." I know the format isn't perfect, but the value here is just too much, and that worked out really, oh. really well. But, but here so. we go. Here's here's the question I have for you. So, you know, Rotowire has been longtime partners with the high stakes uh, league NFFC. Uh, they have been around forever. They run an incredible business. Nobody does high stakes fantasy like them, in my judgment. That's just my opinion. But they have been um, slow to adjust to two quarterbacks. You just mentioned two quarterback leagues, super flex leagues. Now, I think most any almost all the leagues I play in, except for maybe the Rotowire Vegas League, is super flex at this point. Do you think wh- why do you think that they have resisted that at this point? And do you think that they will adapt and, and put in a super flex contest? Well, I mean, there's a couple of factors at play. One is like the tech, you know, that you know, like it's a little bit more complicated when you have super flex. Um, just other just people, uh, you know, adopting it as a market. You want to have something that's the easiest to play when you're, when you're out there selling a product. So well, can't you have both? Can't you? Yeah, you can both? have both. You know, the other thing, the other thing about super flex, the negative about super flex is you know you can't have like 
it's tougher to have like a four, a 16 team league, right. Or even a 14 team league, you know, it gets a little easy, right. So it, it kind of makes it where the number of, of leagues in there. Now they usually have 12 team leagues, so it's not as big a deal. I think they'll come around. I mean, it's a growing trend and I'm certainly a fan of it. It makes the, I think it makes the free agent pool deeper. You know, you have more options and that's always, uh, that's always fun. Quarterback's the most important position in the team quarterback league. It's like the least, right? You know, you know, you don't really, you can just punt forever on it and, and do fine. So it definitely adds a lot, but I think, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta have a, a people that are all, in, all into it and embracing it. You got it, but you know, generally you want to have a simpler product than a more complicated product. But I think yeah. they'll, when I'm you, sure they'll probably yeah. offer it. Greg, Greg and those guys talk, know what they're doing. So yes, they do. For it. They have, make- yeah, absolutely. And you know, I was just going to say, when you talk to them, tell them that, you know, the, the fans want, want a super flex league. All right. Here's the last question well, I, I was going to ask. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to okay. say, cool. my for them is that for baseball, I, mean, I know it's a football podcast. I, that's it's, fine. It did. That is Sunday deadlines. That's my that's one of my mantras for the whole the whole industry. Like you know, like you know, Sunday Sunday night, man. I'm too tired to to do uh, free. <laughs> right, baseball waivers is like a, it's a, you need to like if you want to do it correctly, you need to block out two and a half three hours of time. If you want to do it correctly, yes. you can do it in an hour, but it's a tw- you know you get up early or you stay up late and you have to do it right. It's it's a well, plus. Crazy I mean, you, I also advocate of setting your lineup for baseball, football, and hockey, but baseball especially on Friday because you have three days ahead of you, so you kind of like know that you're going to get the value. Was when you set your lineups on Monday or Tuesday. Usually there's not even a slate of games on Monday for most of those sports. Mm-hmm. And so you usually have some injured guy and you're like, ah, do I put him in there for the whole week or not the whole week? I don't know. So I'm a big advocate. The leagues I run, they all have Friday deadlines. Now with football, this is a football podcast. It's not as much an issue, right? Obviously, you know, there's once a week, so it's not a big deal, but it's a big deal. These other sports. Who's a play. Here's the last one. Who's a player in 2022 that you, even though you should, you're just not going to quit them? Who are you truth or statusing for in 2022? You're just not ready uh, to quit I'm, this. You guy. know, the one guy that I really liked in college, he's been impressive this year, but he just hasn't gotten the volume. But I, I believe in is Rondell Moore. I think that guy's going to be a star. A star. I know he's not like, you know, seven feet tall, but he's so fast. And I just feel like if you just got the volume, um, it's going to be there. So I, I've traded for him in a bunch of keeper leagues. He's been cheap. You know, he's, you know, he's, He's, his stats are not overly impressive this year, but I, you know, I'm a believer. I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna pay off for me. Yeah, up until this year, my truther status uh, was JJ Orsega Whiteside. I was not able to quit him, but that has proved to be a complete <laughs> failure. I think Rondell Moore has a good, uh, a great chance to, um, you know, again to be at least be like a Steve Smith light. You know, like someone that you you plug into your lineup, he gets a few uh, the wide receiver screens, a few end arounds, things like that. I, I like that call. All right, Peter, uh, you were generous with your time. Uh, thank you, and you know, I, I wish and congratulations on all your hard work and your partner's hard work over the last two plus decades. Uh, I'm glad to be part of it with the uh, with the old school regime and now with the new school regime. I, I'm excited to see what happens. And uh, just as a reminder, everybody, uh, when the fantasy football season ends, we don't end with our fantasy football podcast. We are going to be back on Mondays starting in the middle of January with a Dynasty Fantasy Football podcast. And we are launching, speaking of Superflex, Dynasty Superflex rankings uh, i've put them together with a few other guys we're going to be going live with that on christmas day they'll be updated in real time and for all of you people that love play dynasty and love play Superflex, we will have every player ranked i think 250 players ranked so uh, we're growing our dynasty platform at rotowire as we're continuing to grow the um, uh, the sports betting side of it uh peter shanky you you're a mensch you're generous and I've enjoyed working with you, and I cannot wait to continue working with everybody in 2022. Thanks a lot. Next time I'll have my power cord all set up before I actually do an interview. So, uh, the, the, Most people are listening to this. They're not watching it, so they, they didn't know anyway because I was doing the live read. All right, my friend. <laughs> I will see every. Uh, tune back in tomorrow with uh, Mario and John as they do the, uh, the, the Week 16 preview, and good luck. If you're still in your fantasy playoffs and you're in your semifinal, good luck, everybody. Bye-bye.